Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning in for today's episode of the Rice Crypto Show. I'm your host, Chris Rice Crypto. Now, today I have an interview with Suzanne Tarkowski Templehoff. She is a true blockchain pioneer. She is also the founder and CEO of BitNation. We're going to go ahead and get right into today's episode. Like I said, ladies and gentlemen, today we are joined by a true blockchain pioneer. She is the founder and CEO of Bitcoin Nation, Suzanne Tarkowski Templehoff. How you doing today, Suzanne? I appreciate you joining me. Um, hi, yeah, I'm, I'm doing uh, very well, thank you. Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing awesome, and I really honestly appreciate you taking the time to do this interview because I do want to learn more about you and more about BitNation. So one thing I like to ask people, and some people kind of get offended by me asking you to explain who you are, but I like for people to know in your words, who, who are you and how did you get involved in cryptocurrency? Uh, who am I? Wow, that's like the question of the century. Uh, yeah, that's why I wanted you to explain it because you mean, you're a very unique person. You've done so much in the space. Uh, you've been involved, I believe, since 2012, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, and you've done a lot since that time. 2011, particularly, uh, yeah, since since uh, end of 2011, uh, but I didn't start really working more professionally with crypto until beginning of 2013. But um, but I have always been a person who believes in choice, individual choice, and uh, so I was born in Sweden, but my father was uh, a stateless migrant. Uh, a refugee, actually, political refugee from Poland, and uh, we didn't. And my mother was French, uh, so we didn't really have much choice of of uh, over our life, and that always frustrated me quite a bit. And then uh, I just spent like kind of rest of my life kind of moving around and stuff, and. Uh, by the age of 20, I started to explore like competitive governance model. Like, why is it that just because we're randomly born in one geographical area that we have to follow specific geographical rules, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because, because it's that's as arbitrary as, as having to live a certain way of life based on your gender or skin color or any other metric, right? Or any other arbitrary metric. Yeah? So, <clears throat> so I started to think about the system for competitive governance models that were non-geographically based and that was obviously like far before I mean this was when internet was it was very early this was uh, well I started to think about it seriously and write about it seriously when I was around 20 which was 2000 and uh, like around yeah around 2003 or something mm -hmm. and um, and then I thought maybe it's too like far fetched and everything, and I thought about it more like a kind of global insurance company type model, and it was kind of vague. But uh, so, I, so I, instead, I decided to join, you know, the conventional route, and so I started working for conventional governments and tried to change stuff from the inside, you know. And I did that for seven years in multiple war zones. So, uh, or primarily the U.S. government, I'm sorry to say, and uh, yeah, and that was an interesting experience. To seeing countries living in countries without any functional like government, really, and see how well people organize in in a rather voluntary, often anarchy way, and which actually worked fairly well, much better than anything we tried to impose, anyways. And um, yeah, and then uh, end of 2011, I was in uh, DC uh, on Christmas and uh, a friend of mine who I had met through Afghan stuff um, showed me a Bitcoin, like actually like a physical Bitcoin uh, from a company that later on got banned, I believe. Um, Are they the ones, um, it's like the cashless coins that had the QR code, so it's basically a cold storage? Yeah, exactly, okay. yeah. Uh, and he was like, do you, you know, have you ever seen this before? Like, do you know what it is? And I was like, no. <laughs> and he was like, 
well, this is a new international currency, you know, and uh, yeah, like no government controls it. It's just like a new thing, you know, and like that second, it completely blew my brain and, <laughs> and I started to research it obsessively, you know, and I, I was, yeah, it was like, I, I instantly felt like this is exactly what I've been waiting for my entire life. And yeah, after that, I was sold on it. It still took me like another year to kind of put the government in after having discovered it. Uh, well, you, well, you said you've been, you've been waiting for something like this for all your life. And it seems like based off what you're telling me and me researching a little bit about your past, that you were kind of groomed for um, creating BitNation and founding BitNation. So BitNation is a really interesting concept. I've been familiar with it for quite a while. And me and you have talked on and off for about a year. Uh, it's kind of a governance 2.0 model. It's borderless, decentralized, and voluntary. It's the world's first decentralized, borderless virtual nation, which you guys dub DV, DBVN. Um, yeah. So can you tell me a little bit about what Block, what Block Nation is and for people who are unfamiliar to get a, a, kind of a good simple idea and then we can elaborate a little bit? Okay, so basically the basic model is uh, the concept of voice and exit. Huh? Right, or uh, to put it in a, a simple term, opt in and opt out. Huh? Or if you're an anarchist huh, and are interested in those sort of concepts, basically it's the principle of the non aggression principle taken to its extreme. In the sense that you can do anything you want huh, as long as it's consensual, you know, among, uh, as long as it's mutually consensual amongst individuals or groups. Huh? Meaning, so for instance, um, when people talk about anarchy, you know, people say, oh, you know, no rulers, no government, and blah, blah, blah. But the truth is, a lot of people actually do want government. I mean, because it's uncomfortable. Like, if your house is on fire, right, you want someone to call. You want someone to, and more often than not, you want, like, a package of those services. Because, I mean, some people like to build their own computer and choose their own graphic card and choose their own screen and choose their own, uh, you know, hard drive and whatever. But most people, like myself, just like to buy a Mac and be over with it, right? We don't want to sit and think about what mother card we should have, what blah, blah, blah we should have, right? Mm -hmm. And the same goes for governance, right? People are fairly comfortable with the thought of having, like, a one you know, a, a one-stop provider for all of these governance services. So when you say what, I mean, I'm an anarchist, but when you tell people I'm an anarchist, you say, well, we need a government. And I say, yes, okay, we do need a government. I don't object to the thought of needing a government. I mean, there are many valuable governance services. I absolutely agree 100% with that thought. Hence, Bit Nation. So basically, the thought is that there is a government, even not just individual governance services, but you can also choose a package of governance services, but you're not forced to join or belong to anyone. You can just choose your nation as easily as you choose your cell phone provider or your uh, insurance provider or your whatever provider, right? With the same ease and speed. So. It is de facto governance services, but it's not governance services that are in any way forced upon people or where, like in the current system, uh, people are forced to pay for certain governance services because if they don't pay, someone will eventually knock at the, their door with a gun on their hip and saying, you haven't paid for this service, you know, and now please follow me and go to this little cage here where we're going to put you. For not paying for the service, right? So it's basically a way for people to uh, come together and create uh, their own independent governance systems or use ours, whichever, whichever is more comfortable, um, and, and offer it to the people who are willing to pay for it. And that's not anarcho-capitalism. I really want to highlight this point because if you look at it from an anarcho-capitalist perspective, people say, ah, oh, well, this is capitalism and the rich is going to get this and the poor are going to be left to die on the sidewalk, I think. But it's really not that way because in a 
in a free market for government services, in a free market that, in a actually free market, that also means it's a free market for economic models. So you can as well choose to opt into a communist nation where everything is 100% redistributed, right? You can opt in to a socialist nation. You can opt in to whatever economic model that suits you and your purposes, right? Or, or any ideological model for that matter. If you believe in theocracy, if you believe in, uh, you know, atheism or whatever, or whatever, like social or lifestyle model or whatever, right? So it's not, it's, it's a free market model for governance, but it's not an anarcho-capitalist model necessarily. Well, so, I mean, what would be the benefit for somebody right now to become a citizen of BitNation? Does BitNation have, like, any type of jurisdiction amongst nation states or anything to that effect? Or is this more of a concept you're trying to build and get people to possibly adopt? Well, I would say, what is that nation state jurisdiction to start with? Hmm? Because if you look at it technically, so... A nation state jurisdiction, okay, let's take, uh, okay, so I'm in France right now, right? Does France have jurisdiction over me? Yes, technically, you could say that, as I currently live in France and I am a French citizen. But, um, but on the other hand, if I want to do anything in France, let's say, if I want to use the government in any way, uh, like, for instance, let's say I want to set up a company, or I want to notarize a document, or I want to get married, or anything like that. I have to, regardless if I pay a million dollar in taxes or no taxes at all, I still have to pay additionally for those services. And the benefits it gives me to use the French state for those services is marginal, actually, because for them to actually implement it or give me any protection, well, you know, that's left to be seen, really, you know? Uh, I mean, so far, the government haven't done, in any nation-state jurisdiction I have ever encountered, haven't done a great job either providing those services or giving the protection needed. And if I am to define a state, uh, you know, the, if, if we strip what a nation is uh, down to its core uh, services, it's really about security and jurisdiction. You know, now we are used to our government providing everything from, you know, roads to education to, you know, what have you, right? But, I mean, if we really strip it down to a night watchman state, state then, then those are the two main functions. And so far, I mean, I hope to be proven wrong at some point, but so far I haven't enjoyed great uh, security or protection from any state. And, and you've been around. I mean, you've what you lived in Sweden, France, United States, China, Brazil, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Egypt, Libya, Ghana, United Arab Emirates, and Indonesia. Are there more? Uh, well, no. I think that sums it up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the point. I mean, so you definitely have experience with you know since you travel a lot and lived in a lot of different countries to yeah. understand what's going on more internationally as opposed to. Even myself, where I don't have, I, I've got to rely upon the internet, alternative media sources, because obviously the mainstream media is not going to be reporting things that are correct. Can you define what decentralized, borderless, voluntary nations are exactly? And can anyone start one? Okay, so a decentralized, a DBVN, a decentralized, borderless, virtual nation, it stands for, um, Basically, the ability, so the way a nation is defined, according to Wikipedia, is uh, a group of people who have uh, something in common, let's say a common culture or a common language or a common uh, religion or whatever it might be, or a common ethnicity or a common lifestyle, yeah, and who have decided to have some political autonomy in their community, meaning that they set their own rules, essentially, right? And, and in some cases, demand sovereignty for such rules. Um, so basically, a nation is a very, very different thing from a nation state. Huh? Those are two entirely legally separate concepts. So technically, anyone can start a nation. I can 
right now here claim that uh, uh, like I, I can claim that this cup here is my nation and technically legally according to national rights I'm right but whether other will recognize me that's a whole other question I don't think the nation of France nation state of France will recognize that this cup is an independent nation right so, so here comes the dilemma, right? So a lot of people say, oh, but how's that bit nation going to work? Because it has to work in the existing system, right? Because we're still living in a nation state system. And that's correct. But then, you know, it's kind of like in the same way you can see Bitcoin. Yes, we still live in the financial system with fiat and with banks. But that doesn't mean, you know, we can't actually opt out in many ways and form our own rules and our own communities and gain more and more independence that way. I'm not saying it's a quick fix or a direct solution, but I'm saying we can all do it and I provide the tools for doing so. And yes, it will take time. Yes, it will be slow and painful as a process, but we can do a lot more with the technology at hand than we think we can do, actually. Then, most people are aware of at this point. Oh yeah, I mean, you got countries like Estonia that are pretty much completely electronic based. I don't know if it's blockchain based per se. Uh, that's not something I've had a chance to research. And I do know that Estonia and Liberland are partners with BitNation as well. Um, what is What exactly is the free market for governance services? Like, can you talk about that? Um, so imagine, um, okay, so let's say you have your smartphone, right? And you say, okay, so I live in uh, this neighborhood right now and uh, I have seen gangs at night and I don't feel secure. And then you go on your smartphone and you just search in the gov market and you say, okay, uh, security, you know? And then you will have like a range of different services from people just like eBay or Amazon, they can just upload themselves, you know, and say, uh, you know, okay, we offer like drone security services, or we offer like a peer-to-peer -peer neighborhood watch security service. We offer this kind of security service, and, and this is available in this area. This is our reputation, you know, and this is how much it's going to cost or for free, who knows, you know, or you might even get paid to do it, who knows you know, depending on the app structure. And, and then you can just choose instantly which option you prefer and then implement it. Are there, are there any like places that are actually implementing these type of services currently? I think most places are actually. I mean, I'm not just talking about blockchain services, but actually this has been a thing for a very long time. Like uh, for instance, in UK, uh, there is something called comparison websites and they generally deal with things like uh, stuff that would normally be perceived as boring, you know, like, uh, you know, home insurance services, uh, you know, uh, like security services, etc. And people go there to compare prices between all these services and then they just pick one. And this is like an already existing, you know, billion dollar market right that people use every day not people who are in any ways interested in either crypto or blockchain or competitive governance but just people who want to have the most cost efficient insurance right so you know so i don't think the question isn't like does this exist anyway it's rather like where does it not exist and how do we make it more efficient and private and secure and you know how do we scale it globally right well what i meant with okay because i know there's several different uh, nations that are or individuals that are involved with bit nation internationally is there any of these services through the bit nation app that you guys have that is working now or is this again just kind of something you guys are trying to get people to start utilizing um well so the current app that we're working on is quite on the stage uh, because we released it about a year ago, uh, this version of it that is currently on the Google Play and iOS store. Um, so it's, it's very experimental on the stage. But before that, 
we had other products uh, previously that is more well tested on the market. Uh, okay. Like, for instance, uh, we had our uh, public notary together with Estonia e residency program. And uh, we had our another program that was called BREER, uh, that stands for Big Nation Refugee Emergency Response. Um, and so there were thousands of people using it actually for very, you know, some for, for quite complex high level stuff, you know, like ID obviously was a big thing. Um, and, but, and stuff like, it has been used a few times for stuff like uh, land registry, marriages, uh, wills, uh, birth certificates, etc. But also like a great number of time for very like simple, you know, in a way low level stuff, you know, like just freelance contracts or uh, loan agreements and stuff like that. Too. So it actually yeah. had a pretty broad use case and use space. Huh? So now we're kind of trying to take that to the next level with the app, but obviously complex because the app is much more complex than anything we ever built before because it's the back end is is uh, intended to be uh, basically a peer to peer mesh network and uh, everything goes through uh, smart contracts that are enabled uh, uh, through end to end encrypted communication and etc. It's it's very fancy and very long and slow and hard to build, you know. So that's basically BitNation 2.0, which is in its infancy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, that's very cool. I mean, I know there's been a lot of, it's been a lot, uh, because, I mean, this is a growing space. There's been a lot of changes that have been made since the beginning of BitNation. Um, one of the things that I found interesting, we kept talking about reputation. Uh, you guys had these um, non-tradable, reputation tokens um, that like the proof of agreement, proof of collective and proof of NAMIC. Um, can you kind of tell us a little bit more about how the reputation works and what the three different um, reputation non-tradable tokens are for? Absolutely, I can talk about it for hours. So mm -hmm. I assume you really want to bore your <laughs> listeners. But okay, but the basic principle is this. Huh? Uh, if we look at a nation state, uh, if you do, if you do something wrong or you don't live up to your contract or whatever, uh, you know they will put you in jail, basically, you know, or they will put you to a court trial and then you will have fines or jail or whatever it may be. Obviously, as a virtual nation, right, or a virtual jurisdiction, obviously we're not going to put anyone in jail, right? So that's not a very good incentive or disincentive mechanism to make people behave. Uh, you know, according to what they have promised. Um, so essentially, so basically a reputation is, is the only reasonable way to, to as an enforcement mechanism in a non-nation state world, right? And, we, and this is, has already been proven by, you know, everything from eBay to Airbnb to hotels.com to whatever. I mean, the reputation model is widely proven. Right. But then, I assume everyone has seen Black Mirror at this point, huh? and mm -hmm. everyone has seen the episode. Uh, what's it called? Um, talking about the one is kind of like almost based off the China social point system. Precisely. I don't one. know the name of the episode. I think it was in the first or second. Oh, wait. Mm -hmm. I just remembered No Style. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so everyone has seen No Style, and no one wants that. Obviously, we can all also recognize like the horror of living in a kind of, you know, reputation-based Big Brother society, whether it's peer-to-peer -peer or enforced by a central authority, right? It's equally kind of Orwellian either way. So, uh, so the way I think about it, so we have tried to, with, with that in mind, we want a functioning uh, reputation system, but we want it to be non-Orwellian. So there are a couple of ways to do this. Huh? Uh, non Orwellian. Okay. Or Orwellian. Like Orwell, George Orwell. Right, right. I got you. Non 1984. No, I'm very familiar with the book. It's just your accent so strong I couldn't make out what you were saying. Sorry. Yes, no, no, no. It's, it's good that you ask for a lot of people. Yeah, it's, it's a mix between different accents. Um, <clears throat> 
So anyway, so we want a non George Orwell society, right? But that, that still uses the reputation system as the basic enforcement mechanism. No? So how do we do that? So there are a couple of principles that we have to observe. First of all, is that obviously, needless to say, everyone owns their own data, right? Not, not a central base or authority. Second, that it's pseudonymous, huh? meaning that, for instance, if someone is escaping an authoritarian regime or whatever, <coughs> they can start another identity. It shouldn't be easy to start another identity. It should require work and etc. because otherwise we're subject to civil attacks. But it, it should be feasible, right? And uh, third, no biometrics. As, as far as we can avoid biometrics, we need to avoid biometrics because I personally think that it will lead to the next Holocaust if we start to implement biometrics and specifically on the blockchain, actually. It can turn into the greatest uh, authoritarian nightmare we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and then also we try to avoid negative reputation in the sense that people should be uh, positively, you know, like let's say we do an agreement uh, between each other to have this uh, podcast tonight uh, or YouTube hangout tonight. Uh, and let's say your cat falls sick, uh, so you can't do it. Uh, I don't know if you have a cat or not, but anyways, okay, okay you do, okay. <laughs> um, and then, you know, but you shouldn't feel stressed out about the fact that you know, you have to cancel it to take care of your cat to be, have like a negative reputation, right? Because then it becomes like, people are often say that like there is the big uh, brother society, but there's also the big grandma society where everyone is constantly judged on their like new actions, which is very much the Chinese social credit system, right? It's very much like kind of peer-to-peer -peer neighborhood watch type stuff, judgment. And, and that, that's equally oppressive, in my opinion. So we also have to step away from that sort of judgment. So this is why we constructed the social, the reputation system as we have. So basically you have one master token, expat. Um, uh, okay, let me do a quick plug for BitNation here, which you can buy on exchanges, LA token and Bancor amongst others. <laughs> for, I'll have links down below too so everybody can find these things. Okay, great. And, but anyway, so that's the master token, right? And, and beyond, as you mentioned earlier, there are the three non-tradable tokens, uh, proof of agreement, proof of collective, uh, and proof of non-making. So basically, a proof of agreement is the standard reputation token. And it's non-tradable for a reason, because we don't want reputation to be viable or sellable. So basically, the way it works is that when you enter into a contract and when you successfully finish a contract where all parties are uh, accept that the contract is finished, mm -hmm. <coughs> excuse me, Fine. Uh, then you get a reputation token, uh, a non-tradable reputation token, and that shows up on your profile when I was saying successfully completed this contract. Uh, and then when you accumulate enough non-tradable reputation tokens, you also get a financial incentive in the form of expat being airdropped on you. So basically, it's not just that you build up your reputation, but there's also a financial incentive baked into fulfilling your contracts. So that's on the individual level, which is proof of agreement. Proof of collective, on the other hand, so uh, proof of collective uh, means that if you start a nation, and a lot of people want to join your nation and you get proof of collective, but then the scale switches and then it's not so much about popularity anymore, but about the governance services that you provide and, and your citizen satisfactions with them. So then the scale shifts after a while. And then, uh, so in the beginning it's about popularity, but then it's about quality of services, right? Yes. Um, <clears throat> which is measured for simple polls and that people also get paid expats to respond to saying from um, one to seven, how satisfied are you with, uh, let's say, education or security or blah, 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 with the nation you have joined, right? 
and this is a very proven methodology that has been used everywhere. So this is this is a very simple polling mechanism, but it is very like hard proven science actually. And um, so based on that, then you get reputation, non credible again, non credible reputation tokens, as a nation. But then you, as a nation creator, when you accumulate enough non credible reputation tokens, you also get X factor. And the third one, proof of non making. So the name non making uh, comes from, so there are different codes of law here. Yeah? And for instance, here in France, uh, it's like civil law, which means so you have like a huge book where you can read about all the rules, and that's what it is. And then in places like UK or America, and I'm more Anglo Saxon countries on average, um, you have what's called common law which is evolutionary law, meaning that a court case is not necessarily based on what it says in the book of law, but it's based on the last case, the precedent. So that, that classifies as evolutionary law. And nomic means evolutionary. So basically, if you create a smart contract, then, and the smart contract is used by a lot of people, and a lot of people have voted saying, yes, this smart contract for, you know, renting a car, for instance, whatever it might be, is a very practical functional contract that works. Then that you can upvote that contract. So, so basically good laws becomes upvoted in a kind of Reddit style fashion, right? Just like posts get upvoted on Reddit. And people who are good at judging what laws are good also uh, get upvoted as people who are good at judging what laws are good, right? Or what contracts are good. Uh, or it could even be things like, in the future, it could even be things like, not necessarily a law or a smart contract, but it could even be things like, um, you know, a court, court model, for instance, or more complex things, right? I mean, we're very far from that, you know, <laughs> like half a decade away from that sort of things. But, but, uh, but you know, eventually it could be everything. And, and again, it doesn't mean that everyone should comply to it simply because it's the most popular or the most recent one, but it means that people can use it as a reference system. And then in the same way, people receive proof of nomic when they either create a smart contract uh, <clears throat> and share it uh, for, for sale or for free, uh, or, and, or vote uh, intelligently on a smart contract, you know, rate a smart contract intelligently. So, and that's how like a legal nomic system is created. So, yeah. That's so, pretty cool. I mean, I, I like the, the different variations for the different type of ways to get the reputation tokens and, and it's a well thought out structure. Uh, and now with the expat token, XPAT, um, we did say that was on Bancor and LA token. I think there's a couple other exchanges, but it'll all be in the Bitcoin Nation website, which will be links for down below. I know you guys are saying that your blockchain is not agnostic. Mm. Everything right now I, I can see is utilizing Ethereum with the ERC20 and the smart contracts. What, what are your plans and how do you plan to integrate other type of blockchains? Um, are there any plans at the moment well, like that's the multi-million dollar question at the moment. So, uh, I mean, you know, there are several things to take into consideration when you implement a new chain because, uh, yes, we're a blockchain agnostic, of course, but it still takes like a lot of time and energy and, and money, you know, in terms of develop, development resources and stuff to integrate a new chain. So, I mean, there are lots of chains we're looking at. So, I mean, my personal favorite now on a just purely design level, I would say is probably Holochain, but Holochain is so experimental and early stage that I don't think it's worth it at this point. Um, there is EOS, of course, which I personally think is uh, a bit dark, you know? I'm not gonna- Yeah, get... it's, it's kind of tainted in a way. Yeah. I'm not going to go too much into that because I'm so good friends with everyone in the U.S. community, you know. But, but you know, on the other hand, like, yeah, we're a startup. We need a big, you know, developer community. And, you know, to be fair. Yeah, with, with the O.S., I do want to say, like, you know, they have a great community. I've even promoted yeah. the O.S. in the past. On Me and you are not trying to talk negatively about 
EOS. Right. There's a lot of controversy that surrounds EOS is the best yeah. way to put it. Sorry. I just wanted to make sure we had all that clear because I'm not trying to hate on anybody per se. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you know, I think Tezos has a very interesting governance structure, actually, although I'm not, well, uh, uh, I'm not going to go into that too much because I don't want to piss off anyone in the Tezos community either. <laughs> wow, there's a lot of communities. I, don't I mean, you've been in this space for a long time, a lot. I mean, that, that's another thing, too. I will have links down below. But, like, one of the things I love most about your work is your TED Talks. You've done several TED Talks. I, I really like TED Talks. Um, <laughs> So uh, your TED Talks have been awesome. Um, I mean, you've done all kinds of interviews with many, many influential people in the space. I mean, amongst people like Max Kaiser, World Crypto Network. So, I mean, you, you've been featured in like all sorts of different publications like the Wall Street Journal. Let me get my list here because it's insane. I mean, you have like, uh, your work's been featured in uh, the Wall Street Journal, Wired, Forbes, Vice, CNN, New York Times, Bloomberg, Nasdaq.com, Huffington Post, plus like television stations in Sweden, Russia, Venezuela, and France, and BBC Radio. You know, I mean, if people aren't familiar with who you are, I'm that's the reason why I wanted to bring you on because there might be some newer people in the space that just aren't familiar with the OG Suzanne. So I just definitely wanted people to get an idea of who you were and what BitNation was because it's BitNation is a very complex project. I mean, we could definitely do an incredibly long interview, which I know people's attention spans seem to be short, but I do encourage people to explore and check out what BitNation is about. Go on YouTube and just type in BitNation, type in Suzanne's name, Suzanne Tarkowski Templehoff, and all kinds of stuff will come up. So, I mean, and I'll have links for the TED Talks, for BitNation, for like Twitter and all that kind of good stuff. But is there anything that um, that you wanted to talk about before we wrap this up? Because, I mean, I do want to interview you again and bring you back on and we can elaborate on some things and talk about some of the progress that BitNation's making. But I really wanted to just give people a l enough information to get them interested to check this out because if it, if we go too deep, it's just too much information all at once. This is a very, very complex project. It is indeed, yeah. So, well, um, so we are kind of in a transformational phase right now, actually, because we went very much from being uh, like a completely kind of community-driven uh, project and uh, open source community-driven, we're still completely uh, open source, obviously. And then we did our ICO, which meant we had to through all this legal stuff and want to incorporate and become more of a conventional startup and i think now we're kind of finding our middle way through that huh? to have structure but without like all the corporate burden surrounded by it huh? um so we're in a very interesting phase now actually and uh so what we're working on right now is our desktop client huh? which will be available for mac Linux, and windows and uh, if you want to join the test group, uh, join us on Telegram or Discord or anywhere else. You can find all the links on the website. And um, yeah, uh, please download that on Google Play. Uh, and we have some issues with iOS right now, but it will be back up soon on iOS as well. And uh, we would love to hear your feedback. I mean, it's very early stage. Uh, we're we are getting the basics together. It's going to take a long time before this is really a full stack functioning governing system uh, that is opt-in and according to all the principles that, that we are fighting for. But we are getting there step by step, day by day. So, yeah, come join yeah. us. I definitely think that BitNation is an interesting concept. And I think what you guys are creating is, is definitely worth looking into because it makes people think and it expands people's minds. It lets them see other options and lets them see kind of, kind of the world the way it might be, the way that they're not seeing it. Kind of like if the world is kind of really cloudy and you guys get to help clear up a little bit of smoke. You get to put a different perspective on governance. And that's why I like the governance 2.0 model. Um, I like the fact that you guys are borderless, it's voluntary. 
Um, I, th I think all that's great. And I think it's cool that you're using blockchain technology. Um, something else I thought was really cool before I, we wrap up is uh, you guys have done like birth certificates, wedding certificates and things like that that are on the blockchain, which I think are really awesome concepts because I do think we'll get to a point where blockchain technology will be utilized like this. Yeah. What were you saying? We did the first ones in the world, actually. The first ones? Yeah, the first, uh, the first blockchain marriage, the first blockchain world citizenship, the first blockchain uh, land title, the first... Uh, blockchain as child uh, birth certificate. Uh, now the birth certificate was that um, that was your nephew. Yes, yes. <laughs> Which but I think he was really at the same time when we we're doing all these pilots, so you know. It just circles back around. I mean, with the fact yeah. that what was going on with your father trying to get like a visa and for like yeah. years. I mean, it's like it circles back around. It's crazy. It's just part of your history. And it's like, I think it's like, I think it's great what you're doing, man. And I really do encourage people to check out what BitNation is doing and check out all the links down below. Cause um, Suzanne has got some really interesting Ted talks, like I said, and a lot of really interesting interviews. So I encourage people to check that out. So Suzanne, again, I appreciate your time, ladies and gentlemen, this is your first uh, time ever checking out any of my content. I do encourage you to explore my channel. If you like what I'm doing, you can support me by subscribing, hitting that like button, commenting, all that good stuff, because that's what helps other people to see this in the YouTube stream, because the algorithms are working against us, against content creators like myself. So, and as always, I do encourage everybody to be the change by practicing change, and I love you all. Hey, thanks for staying all the way till the end. I just want to give a shout out to the Rice Crypto Show sponsors, Hodl Brand, Going to have links down below so you can check out their awesome crypto apparel. And you can also get 10% off using my code. Cyber Token, I'll have links for their website and the interview that I did with CEO Sean Key. And Monarch Wallet. I will also have links for Monarch Wallet's website in addition to the interview that I did with Monarch President Robert Beatles, aka Crypto Beatles. So as always, thank you for tuning in. I appreciate you. I encourage you to be the change that you want to see in this world. And you can be that change by practicing change. And I love you.